become so associated with Los Angeles publicly, but it's, it's not too much of a liberty for your listeners to assume you were not born and raised here, right? <laughs> Correct. Yes. No, I haven't spent years in acting school perfecting this English accent. No, that wouldn't necessarily be a surprise in Los Angeles either. Absolutely true. But actually, I would like to sound a little bit more American, and I really don't have the actor's ear for accents. So even though I've been here for... 21 years now, I don't seem to be able to make a dent in my English accent. Do you resent it all? I'll, I'll get this answer in brief first. The, the frequent bringing up of your countryman, Rainer Banham, whenever you're discussed. I don't resent it, partly because he influenced me too. And in fact, he and Rainer Banham and another Englishman, David Hockney, who were sort of... He, Rainer Banham would have been a bit older than Hockney, but they both set foot in L.A. and proceeded to sort of define L.A. through their work at around the same time, late 60s, early 70s. And I found both of them to be immensely influential. So, um, and inspiring. I mean, as a teenager, I saw David Hockney's paintings of the swimming pools and um, found them utterly captivating. And there was a man who, when he was in England, came from Yorkshire and painted in really monochrome, you know, when he was still young and painting in England and he came out to LA and was just lit up, you know, lit up by the sexual liberation that he found and lit up by the big skies and the sun and the colors and the freedoms. And it really was expressed in his work. And, and I just absolutely love that. And Ditto for Rainer Banham. I should say that I actually have an even closer connection to Rainer Banham than a lot of other English people in as much as when I left architecture school, I went and worked for an architecture magazine called the Architecture Review. And Rainer Banham, who was known at that magazine as Peter Banham, mm -hmm. which was his real name, Peter Banham was a previous editor of that magazine. So he was, he was referred to a lot around the office as having just having been one of the forebears at that magazine. Um, it was funny to discover that here he was Rainer and back in the office in England he was Peter. But um, So anyway, when in 1987 I first started working for this magazine, The Architecture Review, and I, through a bunch of quite funny but long-to-describe circumstances, ended up on an aeroplane coming out to L.A. to put together a special issue on Los Angeles. And I thought I'd better read up on this place. You know, I hadn't had much time to study up. And I picked three books to look at and one of them was um was Rainer Banham the four ecologies um and I read that on the airplane and I reread it again about six months ago and even though time has changed the LA that Rainer read and it, now it doesn't stand as quite so sort of accurate nonetheless it's still a just a brilliant brilliant book incredibly inspiring it's Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, coming, you, coming to you from Ocean Park in West Los Angeles, speaking with Frances Anderton, who uh, you'll know as the host of KCRW's Design and Architecture. She's also a producer on uh, that station. She's also the Los Angeles editor of Dwell. You'll see her writings elsewhere as well. She has been an eye on Los Angeles, not just architecture, because it's her, her field goes into aesthetics more generally on the show, on the radio show Design and Architecture. It's the subjects range from, yes, buildings, but the city itself to cars to the, the, the design of things you wouldn't even really expect to think about the design of now francis i, I think of a quote from rainer banham and uh, it's he said something like los angeles has received attention but it's the attention sodom and gomorrah received which is the reflection of other people's bad consciences uh tell me a little bit about you know from from the distance of england what what did Los Angeles look like, even if that was before you'd really put it in your mind, before you'd thought about it as a place to go? <laughs> and it's true that I really hadn't. As a European, I would very definitely, or rather from a childhood, I very, very definitely wanted to come to America. But I had always, like many Europeans, assumed it would be New York. New York was sort of front and center of our imaginations. Now, to answer your question about how we perceived L.A., it was very much defined by the movies. Mm. It was very much about Hollywood and if we had a physical impression of L.A., it tended to be one of the freeways. And or rather, it tended to be those mixed messages, I suppose, because there was obviously the surf culture and the beach and Malibu. We probably did have that image somewhat vaguely in our minds. But we also 
had seen imagery of the freeways and we'd seen uh, through really via the many films that showed people in cars occupying the roads in LA um, through all the movies that we saw with many of which of course would well in the 60s and the 70s have gone out into the streets still I can't say that we had a very clearly defined image image of LA cityscape I think that was very vague to us. To the extent I understood the cityscape, it was through houses or it was through residential environments like David Hockney's paintings. Um, maybe Ed Rocher's paintings also seeped into our consciousness. Julia Shulman's imagery of mid-century modern would have had greater traction at their time than when I started sort of becoming conscious of LA which was which was in the 70s as I became a teenager and into adulthood it would have been the late 70s and early 80s well people weren't thinking about mid-century modern architecture at that mm. point people weren't thinking particularly even about the Eames even though I'm sure had you asked who were the famous LA designers I'm sure Eames would have been at or near the top but what was it at that time in terms of architecture people were thinking about postmodernism was coming to the fore and postmodernism was about questioning the givens of modernism and the givens of modernism included car-based culture mm -hmm. and cities that had been redeveloped with privileging the car. So that um, and, and privileging the a historicist architecture so all of that was what was being kind of discussed but la didn't obviously fit into that because la didn't even really have a history to have reacted against you know the and everything was more virgin the whole freeway system was seemed so we didn't understand in europe that there were actually probably that there were several generations of history of architecture in LA, mm -hmm. we, as far as we understood it, the freeway had, the freeways had kind of grown up from from the naked ground. It all seemed to have ri yes, risen of a piece. It just, it just seemed to have risen of a piece. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm trying to remember now. I I really didn't even start formulating opinions about impressions about LA until I'd already been here for two weeks, interviewing people in 1987, getting ready to go back to England to start putting together a special issue on LA and in retrospect there's all sorts of things then that I was utterly unaware of and hence got sort of left out of the picture and one of those would probably include downtown. Which Rainer Bannon wrote about as being essentially non-existent in 1971 which surprises me today because it's the most interesting place in the city to me at this point. Well Rainer Bannon yes absolutely he dismissed downtown but he really did and um, although although I'm pretty sure he would acknowledge some of the individual buildings in downtown. I'm pretty sure even he would acknowledge the Bradbury building. But he was here in the 70s, and the 70s was absolutely the nadir. It was the nadir for downtown. It was the point at which everybody had left and they hadn't started to come back yet. I mean, when I moved here in 91, and I would go to downtown, and it was, it was like going on some strange adventure you know to go down to downtown in the evening you really only saw the only human life was homeless people and there was this strange eerie emptiness that was that was very fascinating but it definitely didn't feel like a place that in any way bore any resemblance to a kind of urban hub and it's only in the last 15 years that downtown has really started to turn around as a place for people to live and eat and shop and and it's great, but the downtown that Raina Bannum saw, all that all that Raina Bannum failed to do was be prescient enough to anticipate that it would change. What he actually observed was correct, because really downtown had been ringed by motor freeways starting in the 1950s, and that motor freeways, even the one-way system, w was all conceived to get people out of downtown. It, we only brought people in for a few hours to work in the, you know, would-be financial center. But, but it was all reconceived by planners and traffic engineers to just be almost like the hub of a series of spokes that just sent people back out to the suburbs. Now, what people, places, writings, what have you, buildings – 
shaped your architectural consciousness before Los Angeles entered the picture for you? Uh, my consciousness was somehow shaped in reaction to, because I actually grew up in a Georgian city called Bath, which is a very, very famous and beautiful tourist city in the west of England that has a remarkable legacy of both Roman and then neoclassical architecture from the 18th century. And I lived most of my childhood in, in fact, all of my childhood in Georgian houses that my father would renovate and then sell on. So I lived in about four, I lived in about maybe six different houses growing up. Every two years we'd move, but each time it would, st yes, it would be another neoclassical house, beautiful, um, uh, beautiful plaster work, beautiful architraves, beautiful door surrounds, beautiful proportions. But there was something about those Georgian houses that didn't resonate with, with me. And then I must have, I do not remember the point at which I witnessed this, but at some point I became aware of the 60s modern space with sliding patio doors leading onto a balcony. And this became my fantasy. My fantasy. The, the doors themselves loomed large in your consciousness? It was, it was the sliding patio doors. Wow. I loved those because, because I was only used to houses where you had windows and the windowsill was typically about a wa at about waist height. And even if you had a balcony, you'd have to climb out the window to get onto the balcony. And I remember, I must have witnessed either in movies or in pictures, these images of, and I think sometimes they're in New York, but of these 60s environments, I think they were probably apartments or maybe they were houses, but but I, I became kind of fixated on my fantasy environment was the dwelling that had sliding patio doors leading onto a deck or mm. balcony. And as you see where we're sitting, that's exactly what I now live in. Yes, I'm looking at a sliding door right now. And it, it sounds like your, your father's restorations. I mean, this was this was a historical project for him then, more more so even than an aesthetic project perhaps. This was about getting houses to to be the apotheosis of, of a certain time in architecture, right? Actually... Not precisely, although nearly. My father probably would have would have upset some preservationists because oh. my father actually was a kind of architect monke. He was a painter who would he was a painter who never fully became a painter, and he would love to have been an architect, but he didn't have an architect's training, and he sort of channeled those desires into buying Georgian houses at a time when they were phenomenally cheap, which was in the nineteen sixties. That's when he got started. But he himself was very interested in the modern lifestyle, the open plan. He wasn't interested in in getting um, age-appropriate furniture. He liked modern furniture. We went on a whole family trip to Sweden for him where he bought steel and canvas chairs. You know, that was in the late 60s. He loved... My first trip to Ikea was as a child with, with him in Sweden. He was fascinated by what was modern and current, and yet there we were living in this old city where you could do nothing to the exteriors. I mean, legally, you couldn't do anything. Legally, you couldn't do anything. I mean, a neighbor of ours went to the High Court of England to fight for the right to have paint his front door yellow and his have yellow blinds. You could do nothing to the exteriors, but you could tinker with the interiors. So my father was a great one for doing what's become commonplace now, tearing down interior walls that were not load-bearing walls, making larger spaces and integrating the dining room and the living room. He was very, very keen on all of that. So so actually you'd walk into the place that we lived and they did not have a traditional feel. But there was but still you could never if you had a Georgian house with beautiful plasterwork on the ceiling, there was no way you were going to remove that plasterwork from the ceiling. <laughs> what he didn't do was add plasterwork where it might have fallen off, you know, as over years of degradation. He didn't try and do these perfect recreations of what those houses were like. It reminds me of a, a Los Angeles novel I come back to often, which is Christopher Isherwood's A Single Man. And of course, the protagonist there is like Isherwood, an Englishman who has come to Santa Monica, near near where we are, in fact, right now. And there are sections of this book where he, he talks to 
he talks to his countrymen who have also come to Los Angeles and they complain, oh, you Americans don't have no sense of history. They don't understand what's important. Look at all this disposable built environment around us, built or otherwise. And the main character, the Isherwood Standen, in some sense, says, you know, you know, you don't understand. Americans, Americans have it right. You know, they, 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 the, when you're in a hotel room in America, you're, you're not in a particular hotel room. You're in an archetypal hotel room. You're, you're, you exist in archetypes. You're in, you're in this efficient world where the, the crushing burden of history has been lifted. And what, what does that na- narrative of, of escaping the crushing burden of history in California mean, if anything, to you? Well, I feel quite strongly about it, and it's interesting that you bring it up because really I was brought up in an environment where you really, really felt the crushing burden of history. I mean, I lived in a town that existed really only as a historical artifact. I lived in a town where on every street corner there was a store selling postcards, and the postcards would be picture postcard views of streets that I lived in, you know. And um, and I'm and and I felt. Or oh, I, you know, I knew through my parents, designers and architects, and they couldn't do anything that was exciting and interesting in Bath. I found it completely stultifying, or I saw that it was completely stultifying. And um, from a, I can't remember at what age I really started to formulate a strong opinion about it. No, I actually I think I know when it was. Now you've asked me, when the year that it opened. We went on a family holiday to France and I saw the Pompidou Centre, oh, yes. a.k.a. the Beauborg, um, um, Richard Rogers Beauborg. And that building was a total sensation at the time. And I remember as a child going up that elevator on the outside of that building that was all brightly coloured, blue and green and red tubes, the sort of entrails of the building being on the outside and this elevator that you'd go, you'd go up and you'd look through and you'd see historic Paris from the elevator and I just remember thinking this had to be the most exciting moment or the most exciting architectural experience I'd ever had. I mean, I had been to Chateau with my parents. I'd been around English country estates. I lived in these, you know, really lovely. I was lucky. I was a lucky, lucky child. I lived in these beautiful houses, but they didn't excite me architecturally. Mm. The Pompidou, it just, whoa, that was just fantastic. And it was the Pompidou that sort of, I guess, must have inspired me ultimately ending up at architecture school. But by the time I got to architecture school, it was a funny period because it was postmodernism. It was suddenly the revisiting of postmodernism. So, so, so anyway, if I can date a moment where I had some kind of awakening about architecture, it was, it was seeing that Pompidou Centre. And my father's interiors, which date back to earlier than that. So those... So anyway, I'm with Christopher Richard on that. I mean, L.A. has really changed in that regard. When I arrived in L.A., what, 21 years ago, there was definitely an L.A. conservancy. There was definitely a preservation movement that, was, that had been galvanized by losses, massive losses like the Dodge House being torn down. And they, had, they were really starting to, um, to strengthen and garner some successes but it wasn't like it is now where preservation has become quite, I won't say it's like Boston or New York yet. It isn't. But it is far stronger in L.A. than it was when Isherwood was making those kind of comments, when Raina Bannon was here, and even when I came here 20 years ago. So we, we English who came here sort of wanting to get away from the burden of history while I appreciate, I certainly appreciate the need to preserve Um, some of LA's fabrics and certainly some of its individual buildings. I'm probably a little more leery than some of my Angelino counterparts about the perils of too much preservation, Mm. you know, because too much preservation, I worry that too much preservation can lead to too much design review and to too much limitation on the beautiful freedoms that were so immensely appealing Mm. to many of us who came here, and that many of us includes people from the East Coast, not just from Europe. It, it takes an outsider, it, it seems, and Los Angeles is a city with perhaps more outsiders than, than insiders, ultimately, but it, it, it does seem to me to, to, to take someone from at least reasonably far away uh, to, to point out, hey, you know, there's, it's, it's the buildings themselves are cool, yes, but it's not just the buildings that are cool, it's the it's the ethos that let those buildings go up, right? 
Yes, absolutely. Because England's a funny place. England genuinely does produce eccentrics and eccentrics tend to be kind of individualistic kind of characters. But at the same time, that individualism somehow somehow um, f fights for a voice within within a society that has hundreds of years of precedent where there is a right way of doing things. There's a done way of doing things. And it applies to everything from the way you build to the way you dress for school to the way you to the manners you use at the dinner table you know so that can create a society where there's certain collective collectively understood standards mm. and there's some argument that that's a good thing it can also create a society where you feel sort of trapped you know and where as a creative person you feel that there isn't room to take a breath and you now you come out to LA and here there's a there's a synergy between obviously the weather or the climate not necessarily it's the, it's the sort of it's the climate where you don't have to worry about that the weather's going to change five times in a day you know you can just get up in the morning and be comfortable in what you're wearing and the weather is sort of dry you're not going to get damp you, you don't even have to sort of think about the weather it's a place where you can just get on with with your work with your project now the weather, of course, at the same time has an aesthetic, there's an aesthetic piece to the weather story, which is it does cast a different light, a different palette of colours. It does enable a different palette of colours and it certainly enables a sense of openness when you can step outside and it's not going to be cold and you're not going to be rained on. So all of those things have obviously attracted people here and so that those physical characteristics um, go hand in hand then with a kind of a mental freedom. Mm. Those are obviously um, to s becoming ever so slightly constrained, you know, as the place gets more dense and there's less virgin land and there's less, the freedoms, things that have got more expensive. It is harder now to just buy a plot of land and build your dream environment. Um, but nonetheless, there's still there's still a sense of this is a place where you can sort of be yourself in quite a in quite a profound way. And I think of the conversations that preservationists have here in Los Angeles now. And I, I was thinking back to an article by Christopher Hawthorne, the Los Angeles Times architect, architecture critic. I should learn how to say that word in an interview like this. Architecture critic, um, who I had on this show a few weeks back, he had an article on on uh, Minoru Yamasaki's buildings in Century City, and he says, you know, preserve these. I mean, don't, don't, uh, don't think they're just eyesores because they, this, this might be something worth considering when you're, when you're listing off buildings to not tear down. And I was thinking, well, that's fascinating. The, the buildings in Los Angeles that are often talked about being preserved or that we should preserve, sometimes they're the buildings that preservationists would have those are those are what those are why people became preservationists. So those wouldn't be built. Do you know what I mean? Like we're preserving what preservationists became preservationists to stop right. a while ago, decades ago. That is absolutely one of the central paradoxes of preservation. Yeah, I mean you've totally hit on it, and it's certainly one that the conservancy and preservation groups all over the country are dealing with is right now as they decide which of the 1960s buildings warrant preserving. The 60s is particularly problematic. Because for exactly what you've just said, mm -hmm. I don't even need to answer this because you've stated, you've, you've answered your own question. It's true. The 60s is really poses an amazing dilemma for preservationists because absolutely it was the excesses of the 60s. It was the, it was the um, completely untrammeled um, um, demolition of cities in the name of um, renewal, urban renewal and getting rid of blight, you know, that caused so much grief and and it's almost bereavement it brought about bereavement so much was so much was destroyed during those periods and yes absolutely up went these buildings that were seen to be excrescences you know buildings that didn't that absolutely they, they didn't just not fit in the urban fabric they 
positively thumb their nose at the urban fabric. Oh, and, sort of the um, Le Corbusier too yes, type uh, thinking. Yes, yes. And, the, and Corbusier, you know, if you do see Corbusier's own buildings, if you see his own, you know, Unité d'Habitation, which spawned a million awful projects, you know, the Unité is absolutely fantastic. But he had this fully realised holistic vision and that building ended up being occupied by, you know, artists and architects who could see it was a fabulous building. Um but no, the, the sort of the bastardized version um, filtered through this sort of the kind of that was a single building. It was like the it was the mass urban renewal that was so problematic. But anyway, to get back to your point, absolutely. Out of that period grew preservation movements. They were horrified, understandably so, at what was being torn down. Preservation movements were birthed. Well, fast forward 40 years and of course, not only have some of those buildings from that era developed a historical importance, you know, cult, they're sort of culturally, historically significant, but some of them are aesthetically pleasing, although generally to less of a to less to less of a wide audience. I mean, there'd be very, it's very it's not difficult to persuade people of the merits of an early Crossman House or of a Georgian building, but there's something about those modernist buildings that is hard for a lot of people to love. Mm. So persuading them to love those uh, those towers in Century City, or persuading them to love, um, I don't know, even the Department of Water and Power. Yes. You know, it's a challenge. It is a challenge, and and it's one. You know, I think the the Conservancy is sort of grappling with how do you um, give historic um, what's it called when they give them historic status? Well, anyway, how do, you know which buildings warrant right. preservation is is very definitely a challenge. And within the architecture community, it's less of a challenge. The architecture community has been brought up steeped in modernist principles, so they tend to have no problem with that period. But that's where the biggest divide between architects and non-architects seems to emerge mm -hmm. is over modernism and and it's and its mistakes in the 1960s. Did you see it as a purely aesthetic issue? Because I wonder, surely you've noticed since you came to America that we Americans have this tendency to prostrate ourselves before things that are just a little bit older than we are. Modernism is not old enough, but maybe if if modernism was not in living memory, we'd be doing the same things with craftsman houses. Like, oh, it's old. It's older than it's older than anybody I know. We've got to preserve it. Do you know what I mean? Might that kick in uh, over any aesthetic objections? It might. It's interesting. I mean, when I first moved to L.A., which is 20 years ago, 1991, I, that was on the cusp of the movement that started to save mid-century modern houses. Up until then, through the 70s and 80s, mid-century modern houses were being allowed to rot or torn down. There was a rebirth of interest in Julius Shulman's photos. There was a rebirth of interest in the Eames. There was a rebirth of interest in case study houses. Dwell magazine started... Um, wallpaper magazine started there was a whole this convergence that produced this frenzy of interest in mid-century modern houses I think there was a generation though that grew up with those houses that looked at their children or the generation that would be their children's age and said how funny that they're saving those houses mm -hmm. yeah that's where you know that's the house I grew up in there wasn't they were they didn't they may have to be nostalgic simply because they were the houses they grew up in, but they weren't necessarily seeing that these were now historically significant. It took the next generation. So maybe that's answered your own question. Mm. It takes the next generation to appreciate the historical significance of something. So it's true. It takes the, it's taking the next generation or the, or, the, or the the next generation to appreciate the significance of some of these buildings from the 60s. But then what has to happen is the distinguishing between what's good and what's not worth saving. You know, mm -hmm. when do you start saving everything? Because, and that becomes the challenge for what constitutes the good example of the period. And when is it right to save an entire neighborhood, which is what some of these preservation overlay zones do? You know, you, you're not, you're no longer saving an individual sort of classic of its genre. You're starting to save entire neighborhoods as kind of classics of their genre, and then it does start to get um, 
it definitely starts to be quite challenging. And then, then it start. Then it's like, are we saving all this because because we're nostalgic for it, or because it's truly of merit? I don't think that's fully answered your question. But again, I think you answered your own question. You seem to be pretty good at answering your own questions. I should stop that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We talk about early 60s modernism and urban renewal and then raising of neighborhoods to build 80-story towers and whatnot, but it's a fascinating complication in Los Angeles. And this might have been something Chris pointed out in his article, or it might be something I'm just assuming, but, you know, those those Yamasaki buildings in Century City didn't replace anything. I mean, the, the, it was just a – Century City itself was just kind of a lot before, right? I mean, it's when when the modernism didn't displace a previous architectural style, you don't have – you don't have that to go on. You don't. You don't have the sort of evils of modernism to talk about because it. What, what was evil about building something where there wasn't anything? Oh no, absolutely, and that's what made LA very different in terms of how we saw LA in Europe. Because in Europe, we grew up with understandings of cities based on imagery of their of their old, or sometimes even ancient urban fabrics. We knew Paris. We knew Rome. We knew Madrid. We knew New York. You know. Um, we knew Buenos Aires. L.A. was this strange, unfully realized sort of amorphous mass that, that was really, we only, that, as I say, we understood perhaps as freeways and we understood as individual houses. You know, we all saw The Graduate. We loved the movie The Graduate. So we understood the house in the valley with the swimming pool. But L.A. is an urban mass. So absolutely, so as a consequence... As a consequence, I do think the preservation movement, well, it started later here. It started later for precisely that reason. Most buildings went up on virgin land. They weren't displacing anything. It was when buildings started to be demolished to make way for something. Which, and that it was at that point that LA started to cease to be completely a new city, ripped from new cloth and started to become more like old when it started to have layers. Mm. And because it was over fights, like it was fights over buildings like the Dodge House that 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 birthed the preservation movement here, just like the Penn Station fight in New York birthed the preservation movement there. But it tended to be, I guess, houses because the residential fabric had been, you know, filling in over the decades, and people had did have this tendency to just buy a house and rip it out and put in the new one. So, no, it's absolutely true. People, the the redevelopment of the 60s in L.A. has not been as great a cause of grief and pain as it has been in other cities, except in downtown Los Angeles with the Grand Avenue redevelopment, where you saw Bunker Hill torn apart to make way for renewal. And that was definitely the demolition of a neighborhood that had they had they not torn it down, you can imagine those would be the most desirable houses in downtown and in wow. in the in the basin, I mean, just imagine how how people would have done up those old Victorians. the The rooming houses would have been turned back into houses, or they'd have been turned into condo developments, and they'd have been so sought after by now. It would be gorgeous. Wow. People would love them more than they love the Aeon Plaza or what you know, whatever building is up there. Them. People. I've done this project. I did this project with students at USC and Gary's office that produced. I'll have to give you a copy actually that produced this book about, and it's about the urban renewal on Bunker Hill. They have struggled to get people to love Bunker Hill. People will, over the years, they will definitely preserve the Disney console. They'll preserve the music center. I don't, I can't imagine a point where they're going to preserve some of those towers. Mm. Now for, for listeners less familiar with Bunker Hill, it, is, it has these, these landmarks like the concert hall, like the music center. It has these, these cultural landmarks, but it also is it's covered in skyscrapers. I would say the average year of construction or design is maybe 1982 for some yeah, of the... Cal I mean, Plaza. The Cal Plaza buildings absolutely would have been early 80s. They're, they're so nondescript architecturally. I mean, they're shiny. They're shiny. But, but you know what? they will at some point be recognized as the product of their time, you know, and the all about the underground parking, all about the the sort of buried urban plaza. Um, but there aren't that many examples of that. So it may come to be that preservationists deem them worth saving. Mm. And it may come to be that the very people who 
were horrified and appalled at the the demolition of the houses on Bunker Hill may, you know, in their later years, find that they start defending what replaced the houses on Bunk Hill. Mm. It's very, it's very, very odd, the whole kind of preservation impulse. And it definitely has, until recent years, played out differently in L.A. But it's starting to become a force in L.A. that's somewhat similar in other cities. Of course, in other cities, very few other cities really have terrific stuff from the 50s and 60s. And L.A.'s lucky in having really quite a legacy of 50s and 60s architecture um, since that era has become recognized as worthy of saving. We've got a lot of pretty interesting stuff. I find that the people who I talk to here, who I meet here, who least appreciate Los Angeles or the, the built environment here are the, the native Angelinos, the ones who were born here and have lived here 40, 50, 60 years. They, they tend to have gone blind to a lot of the city's qualities. And, you know, we've talked about your coming from England and the perspective that gave you and me moving here recently. And you know, I, I like to think I, I have, I'm not yet blind in one year to Los Angeles, but... Tell me about. I mean, you've 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 thought about architecture, not just in England, not just here, but Italy and India. So I've read and, and elsewhere. What what does having a global perspective bring to bring to thinking about Los Angeles? I mean, do you, it seems to me I, maybe it's an impulse, but that that having a wide experience of world cities helps you appreciate Los Angeles, or would help anybody appreciate it. I hope so. It certainly. It certainly means you can zoom out and have a bird's eye view and kind of understand the physical environment relative to other physical environments. But it also, I would say having a world perspective, and I'm sure this is true of you and true of other people who've come from other places. I do think it means actually that you have the um, freedom to occupy or use the city in a different way. I mean, when I lived in London, I cycled everywhere. I, I, that's how I commuted. I was, a, I, was a, I was a commuter cyclist. During my summers at college, I was a dispatch rider because I like cycling. Then when I moved to LA, I just sort of assumed that when I got to LA, I would carry on cycling, even though I knew intellectually that it was a car-based city. But when I got to here, I did find it was primarily a car-based city. And indeed, I got a car. But having never driven until I was 27, I didn't feel in any way that the car was an extension of me. The car was just a choice. It was a choice that I could make like getting on my bike. And so as a consequence, from the moment I moved here, I, ma I maneuvered myself into a lifestyle where I was living partially as a native Angelina would do. I was partially driving to my workplace and certainly the longer trips and enjoying and frankly enjoying it, enjoying freeway driving when the freeways were were, uh, were unencumbered with traffic for sure and, and really kind of getting into that kind of LA thing. But but I could absolutely at the same time, I could hold competing thoughts at the same time. You know, I'd, I would um, be cycling within my neighborhood. I, I, I chose to live in a multifamily, you know, rental situation because – that had brought with it kind of urban benefits that I was used to in the older places, such as having some proximity to work, walking to the shops, walking to the beach. I felt all of those things were values because they were things I grew up with as just understood values when it came to choosing an urban environment. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I, I, it just never occurred to me that the way to occupy LA was to get my single family house in a very suburban environment and drive to work. It just didn't occur to me that that's what I kind of de rigueur had to do. So I think that's something that, that, that living in other cities gave me was just the ability to make the city my own in a way that suited me. Um, even as I can, as an, an analyst of the city, I can read its differences to other cities and a lot of those differences have to do with that privileging of the car the car being the generator of so much of its urban form the predominance of the single family house etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm. 
I mean, I, it's 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 not so different from my experience. I mean, cycling is the main way I get around Los Angeles. I'm only 12 miles at most from any place I would want to go, so it makes sense. But I think back to an episode of your radio show, Design and Architecture, where you had Chris Burden on, who recently did the, the piece Metropolis 2 in, in the, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And listeners, you may have seen this or been... If you're not in Los Angeles, maybe you've seen it on the internet, but it's this this model city whimsically built, but it's it's encased in sort of uh encased in, in rings and rings of freeways and then these cars go very these little model cars go very quickly all around it. And you interviewed Chris Burden on design and architecture and he seemed w- with he seemed to have a dedication to the idea that that self driving cars are the future in with with such a strength of, of certainty that it seemed almost insane to me given that that was the, the, the idea was self-driving cars and he, he's in his mid-60s as i understand it uh he's a different generation than i am and this is the thing i read about in, in trend pieces the generational divide you know someone 27 uh isn't driving whereas someone who's 65 is going to drive the car to his grave you know it, it's especially in los angeles do, do you see that generational divide and is he really that serious about the self-driving cars um, I don't think he's entirely serious, although, yes, I do think there's a generational divide. I will say that you probably heard Dan Neal followed up, mm-hmm. and Dan Neal completely poo-pooed that whole notion. Um, and Dan Neal speaks as one who's driven every car you know, that's come off the uh, production line. But, um, no, I absolutely do see that generational divide. I think that generation, the 60-somethings in L.A., they had a fun time driving. Driving was bliss. The freeways were not jammed. Now, admittedly, they had smog that to this point they couldn't breathe barely, but still that didn't seem to you know, worry them too much. They did have that lifestyle where you could live in Pasadena and sur- be at the beach in half an hour and surfing you know, in the morning and then be out at the mountains in the evening and all of that. You know, They used to say that about LA. And also they were of the generation that would have, what would they, would they have been brought up in suburban milieu? It would what, have been post, post, post-war post kids, been, so yeah. They would have been post-war kids. They would have been post-war kids, but they also would have been rebellious 60s kids. Mm-hmm. They weren't of the generation that I think came next in America that has really repudiated its parents' lifestyles. I feel as if... I see, I because I'm on, I'm in the middle of that. I'm neither the '60s era baby boomers nor my thirty something, sort of throwing off that generation. I'm I'm absolutely squarely in the middle, and as a consequence, I've got a sort of foot in both. Um, so I can understand the lure of the LA freeway and the joy of the driving, but I can also completely understand the horror at the lifestyle that that's produced. And what I see in the younger generation is um, is sort of cycling and walking almost as a political movement, almost as a sort of political statement. It's sort of this is, we're not going to express our um, revolt against our parents' generation through rock and roll. We're going to express it through walking and through cycling. This is, I, I feel as if, those these kind of alternative or in LA let's say in LA's alternative modes of transit are a kind of a statement um, and there's almost a sort of militancy about making that statement that seems to be tied up with a wholesale rejection of the suburban lifestyle and hence that generation the 30-something generation is drawn to downtown um, and is very much part of the kind of cycling as a collective political movement not just something you do for pleasure or to get from a to b Mm. um so that's sort of how i see it i mean when i moved here i i can remember meeting mike rotundi you know who is an architect who was then director of sark and he was part of that 60s generation you know for all i know who's probably a friend of chris burden's and i just remember him just waxing lyrical about driving and how zen it was to be on the freeway, you know, listening to music and how that's where he would do his thinking. And for, for, and that is where it was. But it's also where people would make out with their girlfriend, you know, with their yeah. partners. It had, the car had a more sort of, 
sexy mystique that I think was lost, you know, to to this generation that didn't need, didn't use the car in that way. Right. The car just became something you got stuck in in traffic or it became something you were ferried in by your parents to school. It, it, it seems like a lot of this, the proposed solutions by members of that generation here in Los Angeles are not not necessarily alternatives to the car, but ways to ways to bring back 1962. And it's sort of saddening to me. Like, I don't, that, it, 1962 ain't coming back. I mean, there's no way. Um, so I don't really know what the resolution of that, of that tension is. I mean, we see more transit being built here now and all that. So, you know, one side is making inroads clearly, but uh, you never want to break it to somebody that uh, the world of their youth is gone, right? Those of, of that generation who traveled, have a diff do have a different perspective mm. you know tom main the architect tom main for example now has an office in new york he lives in new york even though he grew up in southern california and even though he's absolutely of that 60s generation he is appalled at what he sees as the slow embrace of public transit here he 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 goes, he, he races around, he goes to China, Japan, he sees all the bullet trains, you know, he's one who absolutely understands that LA cannot be car based. I think once people start traveling, and once people realize that the 1962 era driving has been replaced by gridlock that keeps you in traffic between Santa Monica and Westwood for an hour, you know, I think they... I think they understand that there has to be an alternative, but but I do agree that they don't necessarily embrace it with the greatest excitement. <laughs> you know, I think I think they would like the roads to be emptier. Yes, right. yes. Although I, as I say, I do I I think that it does differ with different people's experience. Mm. But if you grew up here, and um, you recall that very pleasant way in which the car enabled a kind of a lifestyle, it is. It does make one a bit nostalgic, I think. Now, you've been hosting Design and Architecture on KCRW for 10 years, and I think that somebody who hasn't heard it uh, would would wonder, you know, isn't, isn't radio maybe the least suitable medium to discuss design and architecture? But they can listen. They'll find that it is, in fact, suitable. How did, how did you find out that it would be a suitable medium for the, that kind of discussion about aesthetics? My background was in architecture, and then I went to work for an architecture publication in London. Then I came and edited one here. And then while I was there, the riots, we had the Los Angeles, the Rodney King riots of 1992. To cut a long story short, the experience of those riots propelled me to go and work for Warren Olney and his show, Which Way LA, because I felt here was this show that was born out of the riots that was having this dialogue about the city in its broadest sense that was so incredibly powerful and compelling. So I went and worked for him and I became a producer. And then there I was, I found myself in radio. I had never particularly planned to be in radio at all. The only thing that I planned was to go and work for Warren Olney on his show, Which Way LA. And it, at the time, it was relevant to everything I was doing in architecture, at least that's how I saw it. Well, as the years passed, Which Way LA became less to do with LA and more to do with all manner of subjects. And it even became a national show. And I got more and more immersed in the station. And I, and, the, and thereby, I got to know our other programming. And I got to know the manager of the station. And I my, my, my boundaries extended beyond just working with it on which way. And I sort of, I never gave up writing about architecture. I never gave up, um, you know, being part of the kind of architecture community. And I realized that that there we were there I was at a radio station that really did talk about all manner of aesthetics obviously you know the our world aesthetics in music we did music but we did film and we did art and um theater and we covered all sorts of culture and it really started to baffle me that we weren't covering buildings i i realized that here you had all these highly sophisticated very intelligent people at the station for whom it simply didn't even enter their heads to cover what was going on in the built environment. And, and at that point, which was the mid-90s or late 90s, when I started to really kind of be aware of this, we had the Getty Center going up, the Disney console going up. I mean, these major, major projects in L.A., not to mention all the smaller scale projects that are of social 
importance and usefulness and just merit talking about. So anyway, I guess I became friends with the general manager of the station. I just used to, I used to talk to her about what's going on. It's, you know, there's so much going on and there's all these architects emerging on the national stage. Of course, one of them being Frank Gehry, um, famous LA, you know, really putting LA on the map. And she, she got more interested, but it still, she didn't see there being a kind of a natural, it being a natural fit to be an architecture program until one very specific, specific thing happened, which is the, now actually, I think I need to backpedal a bit here and say she did recognize that we needed to do something about the Disney concert hall. Mm. And we did cover the Disney concert hall. But then what happened was LACMA commissioned Rem Coolhouse to come and be its architect of a new, of its, of its um, redevelopment. And Rem Coolhouse proposed tearing down LACMA. And this caused a riot. There was a lot of people who read about this in the LA Times who were really not happy at this idea. And you don't hire Rem Coolhouse unless you know he's going to say something, something, at least at least that inflammatory. Right. So he made this inflammatory um, gesture that bugged a lot of people who normally wouldn't be talking about architecture. And Ruth Seymour, who's manager of the station, said, we have to talk about this. There's a story here. And she asked me to host a program, one program that would be about the LACMA and the decision to have Rem come in. And I guess I did. I went on air. She just stuck me in front of a microphone. I was absolutely terrified. She got, somehow we corralled together some people to talk about it. We didn't actually have Rem himself. And I just batted the ball back and forth between these speakers. And I was really terrified. I don't know how I got from the beginning of the show to the end of the show, but I did. And somehow out of that, Ruth decided that architecture was a topic that could go on radio. And that's what started it. Now, Ruth loved conflict. She loved the conflict side of it. And I would say there's so many different ways of talking about architecture and design that aren't just about a dispute over a building. She definitely loved the dispute part of it. But anyway, that's how it was. That's how the top, that's how the show was born. It has, it is a challenge. I mean, I learned pretty quickly. You do not spend too much time with an architect going into the minutiae of a building that sends people to sleep. And generally, you don't even stick exclusively with architecture because actually that starts to send people to sleep. You do take on the whole gamut Um, because people in L.A., there's a lot of people in L.A. who are very interested in design because their careers are tied up in it, whether it's art production or animation or product design or fashion. There's a huge, huge industry of people here all in some way or other involved with design. And the people that say are involved with fashion or graphic design, they'll tend to also be interested in architecture and their interiors and their surroundings. So it all goes together. It's all of a piece. What What is the way you can limit design as a subject so that it remains coherent, so that it's not just what, whatever anybody would want to include under design? Do you know what I mean? It, 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 the umbrella can be a bit too wide if uh, if you're not careful, I would imagine. It definitely is. I mean... It's partly intuitive. There's partly just sort of stories in circulation that I hear about and I just, and I'm personally interested in them. I think that sounds really interesting, but I do tend to kind of make a list of things that are, I'll look for things that in some way reflect what's going on in the zeitgeist, you know, so there's something that goes beyond just, I'm not doing, I'm not doing an HGTV kind of look at you know, a remodel of a house. It's not that, which, and that's sort of, that's the core story. So I'll do, um, so I will look at things in the context of what's going on. You know, so for example, I just did something on the competition to find an architect for Union Station. Well, there's also efforts to find architects for other buildings. Like why do I uni- do you, the Union Station competition and not the other buildings where they're looking for architects? Well, obviously Union Station figures in a lot of people's minds as a sort of mythology in minds, but also the whole issue of public transit and whether we're going to hi- have a high-speed rail, it coincided with efforts to kind of stop the high-speed rail. There was a, there's like a whole conversation going on about high-speed rail, so it made sense to do Union Station as a story. So sort of that's the way, that's the way I, I kind of think about things. And there's, and, But that's not the only way. You know, I'll hear about something or somebody who is a very has a very interesting take on it, like Moby. You know, I in, in, interviewed Moby. I mean... Moby's a musician who's very well known for his dance music, but I'd read his blog and 
he just was really very, very interesting about architecture. And, you know, I, there, though I knew that our audience, we have a music audience. Our music audience is going to be interested in hearing from Moby talking about something or counterintuitively about a different topic. So there's different factors, but, but I, you know, I am thinking about what the KCRW audience is and what, what, what they might be interested in. I do think that our music listening audience is also overlaps with that 30 something generation mm. that actually is pretty interested in design, but also is shaking off the fifties suburban lifestyle. So I'm sort of interested and aware of those themes. Now I'll draw up a list of ideas that I think are interesting and I'll give them to, to a colleague of mine who does not have a design background and I'll have, have him read through them and he'll kind of determine from a sort of the so-called layperson's perspective what makes an interesting story. And that conversation with Moby about his architecture blog, I think he calls it something like Moby's Los Angeles architecture yes. blog. Um, you, you get what you, you get what's on the label. Um, he, he made some astute points saying that, you know, Los Angeles, he coming from New York, he found Los Angeles to be surreal and, and, almost a certain randomness to it and the, the the standard aesthetic laws don't apply. I mean, tell me at this point in, in your career in Los Angeles, do do you see a surreality here or a randomness or do you still see do you still see an escape from history that it offers? Do you see do you still see a frontier, a work in progress in Los Angeles or sort of a forever incomplete work? What what is it has it has it stayed the same thing to you as it was when you came? Is it something different now? I mean, what has held your interest in Los Angeles? I think it does have the random randomness. I think it varies from city to city. I think Santa Monica is less random than L.A. or Inglewood, and because Santa Monica has a very strong kind of planning and design review kind of process that results in a very clearly thought through and integrated sort of urban fabric it may lose some of that delicious randomness um he lives he comes from came from new york i came from from bath and then london in both of those cities you have row houses you have row houses that become whole areas of urban fabric you have this very very strongly woven together urban fabric even more strongly woven together in new york than in london where london was devastated by world war ii bombing and so you did have ruptures in the urban fabric and you did end up with these odd juxtapositions of eras you add to that what you have in la is not only do you not have the urban fabric that emerges from the from the from the row house i.e the sort of the bonded the buildings that have sort of bound together in streets but then you also had um, land use. You had zoning that was um, – the zoning isn't entirely random, obviously. You couldn't have residential on the commercial strips. So it wasn't entirely random like, say, in um, Houston where it's even more random. But it, you definitely would have that aesthetic randomness of buildings that were completely unesthetically related next to each other and buildings of scales that were not related next to each other. I mean, in terms of whether I still find it stimulating, let's say I still find it as kind of beautiful. To me, LA has a beauty. I go back to London and I know so many people, particularly um, Americans, who love London. They rave about it. It's so marvelous. It's old. We just, we just fall down on our knees when yes. we get there. And I appreciate London. I appreciate London. I can definitely see its glories. I can't say I love it. Oh, I can't say I love the physical environment. I don't love the buildings of the Edwardian era that line the Thames. I don't, I don't love Big Ben. I don't love the neo-Gothic. I love Melrose Avenue. You know, I love the bizarreness of, of what's a street that's kind of ugly. Okay. Lincoln, Lincoln is everybody's ugliest street. Is it there really? Is... You could have said so many streets. I didn't expect that one. Well, maybe I'm talking. Maybe I'm talking about West Siders. Uh. West Siders think Lincoln's really ugly, and it kind of is. But I still sort of love it. You know, I, the big, the bizarreness, the juxtaposition of the Power Boy billboards. You know, against the f funny little hut selling tacos. You know, mm -hmm. cheek by jowl with a car showroom you know i do i guess i do love that and then the big open sky 
there's an actual genuine beauty of Bullock's Wilshire and City Hall and the Bradley Building and, you know, many, many houses. There's also a complete banality to a lot of LA architecture, but somehow even that banal architecture I feel at home with, I I love, I, is it is it because the trees are tall in the buildings? That's something that I've always been struck by about in LA. But in so many parts of it, the trees are taller than the buildings. And and then you, as a consequence, you get that great big open sky. I'm rambling a bit here. I am rambling a bit here because I do appreciate that LA is jolly led in an extreme. It is ugly beautiful. One cannot argue that it's all beautiful. But the beautiful parts I find really beautiful and the ugly parts I find interesting somehow. <laughs> I've been speaking with Frances Anderton. She is the host of KCRW's Design and Architecture. She's a producer on that station. She's the Los Angeles editor for Dwell and More. Frances, thanks so much for taking the time today. Well, it's a great pleasure to talk to you, Colin. Thank you so much. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I have been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to everyone who backed this season on Kickstarter. Danny Bolson, Brad and Laramie on Movies, Paul Doyle, Umberto Grant, Matt Howey, Andrew Hovenick, Mark Hines, Mary Gillander, Eric Graham, Will Graham, John French, Andrew Philippon Jr., Kimberly Hahn, Chris Kay, Andy Cooney, Mark Larson, Rebecca O'Malley, Michael O'Regan, Gail Poole, Blake Riley, Superfan Giovanni, Aidan Nullman, Adam Schaefer, Rob Schultz, Scott Schenker, Cam Smith, Kevin Smokler, Adam Sutherland, TSD, Thomas Unterberger, Matt Warren, and Wayne Wright.